Welcome to CFO Principles interview series, where we explore how businesses are built. In this episode, we're talking to Michael Nikitin, the CTO and co-founder of Ada. Ada is a software company that enables healthcare providers and patients to um, move through the healthcare system significantly faster. So when patients enter uh, a a healthcare system, they typically go through it multiple facilities. And this platform is helping uh, healthcare providers reduce uh, patient overstay, thus reducing the overall costs and um, improving the overall efficiency. So think about the impact that they have that they can have on our entire economy as a whole, right? Given how expensive our healthcare system is in the United States. But so obviously this platform is immensely uh, valuable for healthcare providers because they save them millions and for the patients overall because they're helping them uh, with their experience through the healthcare system. But to me, this is actually um, interesting for a different reason because this is actually an example of a company who's trying to enter a very uh, stale marketplace with a brand new product and the challenges that they have to face are very relatable to a lot of um, entrepreneurs who are building innovating, innovative uh, software out there. And the challenges that they have to face of penetrating the new market, building the software at the same time and juggling all the challenges um, is very interesting. So I really hope that you enjoy this and uh, I'm going to have Michael begin the story by telling us the origin uh, of, of uh, Ada and where it all began. We started about um, three, four years ago um, when my friend approached this interesting problem and he knew me before for probably five, ten years prior. Uh, of my technology background. Uh, I've uh, founded Itera before, focusing on technology consulting, worked at Microsoft, Real Networks, and other um, technology uh, projects. And he had practical problem on his hand. He owned a couple small healthcare uh, care facilities and had struggled bringing patients into those facilities. So, so kind of, to some degree, very practical marketing problem. But when we start looking deeper with my technology and business background, the problems are complicated because of the HIPAA, because of the healthcare system in the US, because of the payer infrastructure. Um, it was very hard to see kind of on the face of it how we can help um, real you know, brick and mortar businesses getting patients into their doors. Mm-hmm. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, we start thinking about it. Um, looking into possible options, looked at you know, obvious solutions like marketing, Google, um, other obvious things where you would go to. Nothing clicked uh, right away because of this um, ecosystem of US healthcare that we have right now. Um, then we started looking into uh, similar industries and, and, and look, looked at you know, what's, what's you know, modern and interesting there was, for example, uh, Uber, Airbnb, and other similar platforms, B2B platforms, where people would use you know, companies with technology to bring uh, clients into, you know, into vehicles, for example. So we use similar approach where we would be a technology connecting uh, upstream and downstream providers and bringing patients to the right facility at the right time. So, and um, what was the... Right. So as you guys were developing the product, what was the journey to build the product and where you're at now? And um, kind of what were some of the some of the key components that you had to put in place to get that product off the ground? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we, we looked at it as a, as a you know, classical startup approach. First, we would look at you know, who are our clients. And by clients, we looked at you know, financial clients, who would pay us for our service. Um, digging deeper into healthcare incentive system, specifically payment system, we realized that uh, for what we are building, uh, the biggest beneficiary would be hospital. You know, traditional brick and mortar hospital, usually regional medical center, would have they would have a patient. And the problem that they would have is moving those patients into smaller post-acute care facilities. And they are willing to pay us to find right place for right patient. So mm-hmm. we would focus on the hospital first. Um, uh, kind of being in Seattle area, we had a couple of connections in a couple of local hospitals uh, and we were able to go in person and talk to those people who work there. Uh, and they were happy to chat with us uh, and happy to provide their feedback, uh, focusing on a specific narrow problem. And no one is kind of looking and trying to solve a specific narrow problem. Patients leaving hospital and going to post-acute care facility. 
your retirement facility, your skilled nursing facility. So, um, so keeping very specific narrow focus on you know, actual financial customers, we were able to kind of visualize our you know, core minimum viable product, understanding you know, what do they need uh, to get some kind of financial benefit to them. So those are kind of initial uh, anchor for our first MVP and first uh, beta release for the hospital. So once we've built, kind of, once we understood it, uh, the first kind of beta scope. Um, we involved a few friends uh, with the purpose of fundraising. So we were able to um, get initial um, uh, seed round going and collect somewhere in the ballpark of half, five, half, half a million dollars uh, to build the initial MVP of the product. Mm -hmm. So, so. And what was the, what was that uh, as you were raising funding? Uh, did you go to, uh, I know you, you mentioned friends, but that's a very vague term, right? Is that, uh, did you go straight to VCs? Did you go to angels? Um, and what was the conversation like as you were approaching people with a product that is not yet there? Yeah, yeah. No, it was obviously very interesting conversation, especially with VCs. It was very, very short conversation with VCs. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's still, it's still, it's still interesting. Uh, and longer now when we have, you know, revenue coming and we passed uh, one million ARR, conversation became longer. But it's still not where we would like it to be. Uh, mm -hmm. But initially, yeah, conversations with VCs initially were pretty much it was impossible to get a hold of them because uh, when you don't have a product, you don't have, you don't, you don't have a customers, you don't have revenue. Revenue, um, our my experience is VCs is not interested. Uh, so unless you have product, unless you have real ARR, uh, VCs is usually um, very hesitant to, to get uh, involved. Um, angels are not as much. So 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 we reached out to a number of local angel groups. Um, however, it was very hard as well without um, actual functional product, without functional uh, beta or, or actual product. And without having you know, real customers, uh, it was impossible to get any funding. So what worked well for us is basically um, circle of our friends and people you know they know. So and that was very very um, very successful. So we approached fundraising very as a very kind of strategic, uh, methodical workflow process, um, similar to sales. So we had a funnel, incoming funnel of leads. Um, we would use CRM uh, platform, a real CRM platform to track those leads, uh, track our communications. Uh, we had um, marketing messages had gone to them. Um, we had um, basically our sales meetings, internal and external with them. So, and, and having that uh, structured approach, structured sales approach targeted at uh, fundraising process uh, helped significantly. That's, uh, that's an interesting uh way to go about this right because it is a sales process but oftentimes there's really treating it like a sales process becomes very becomes very foreign and very scary for a lot of people now what um what were some of the downsides of that approach right or did you find any um as you were as you were conversing people did you put people off by sending them automated messages or did you choose or was everything organic? It's just they use a CRM for managing and understanding when to follow up and when not to follow up. What was that? What was that mechanics of that like? Yeah, majority of outreach were uh, organic. Uh, we had some kind of regular updates going on. Um, uh, I'm trying to remember maybe bi-weekly, like sending mm -hmm. bi-weekly updates or, or monthly updates to to our target list. Um, so far, that wasn't too much. No one complained. I don't remember anyone you know complaining too much about it. So that worked out fine. Uh, but majority of interactions and communications were organic ones. Uh, so it didn't didn't raise uh, you know too much eyebrows. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, but talking about downsides, you know, the biggest downside in my specifically in my opinion is. Uh, Fundraising process is is, is an art uh, in, in many ways, and the the piece actual piece of art that you're building is your uh, deck, you know, your pitch deck. <laughs> <laughs> and as with any piece of art, um, you tweak it indefinitely. <laughs> kind of, kind of. So, and with every meeting, with every presentation, with every feedback, loop of feedbacks, we would tweak it. So, uh, you know, where we started and, you know, six months into it, the deck were very different. And with every <laughs> presentation, it would grow and change. <laughs> yeah. So that was interesting evolution. Um, but as a result, you know, 
whoever saw a presentation initially and maybe saw it again, you know, six months later, they would they wouldn't recognize the deck. <laughs> so, so it changed every time. So that yeah. was kind of interesting side effect of this kind of hybrid strat- strategic growth and kind of organic iterations um, uh, in this fundraising process. Yeah. Okay. So you got you you got the half a mil, right? I'm sure it came over a series of of many checks over a longer period of time, but let's pretend that it was all at once. Um, you got to check now what? What's, what, are the, what is the next thing that you decided, now this is what we're gonna do? How do you build a team? Where, how do you decide what the, what the first pieces of code are going to be? And how do you go there and, uh, and go to the next phases as, as whatever you define them to be at? Yeah, yeah, and um, f- from a, you know, for me as a technologist uh, uh, in the background, uh, building a product is easiest part. Uh, the hardest part is selling it, uh, and, uh, finding investors, and then selling the product to the customer. That's for me the hardest part. But um, I think in my case, in our specific case, my co-founder uh, Julian, he is background in actually sales. So, and he's really the reverse of me. <laughs> so mm-hmm. for him, creating a product is hard part and selling is easy part. So, so we, yeah. we have really good relationship there, good symbiosis. Um, so once once we got some initial funding and initial funding came from, from me and him. So, so we pitched in initial you know, first couple checks uh, to, to start the product. And um, having the telling over the scope MVP, we started dealing with the product as soon as we you know, had initial initial funds. Mm-hmm. Um, with my background in technology and consulting, I was able to create a team pretty quickly in Ukraine here. So we are still using offshore software development team there um, and started doing the product. The, the, the hardest part was launching the pilot with actual customer and getting you know, actual users using the product. Because we're talking about you know, actual hospital with actual you know, uh, patients uh, and the nurses using the product. Uh, getting into you know U.S. hospital um, is hard, um, as, as you can imagine. So passing the um, security and legal aspects, uh, making sure that it's HIPAA compliant, uh, checking all the boxes with you know all the appropriate teams in the hospital. That was the, the hardest part. Um, engaging nurses to use the product. That was the hardest part. In my mind. What was the timeline like from the very first? Let's say you have the product now, uh, the very first uh, conversation to product is in where we're piloting it in, in, inside your, um, your the, the hospital. What was life cycle? How long did it take? What were the key pieces that you had to tackle there? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, it's you touching on a very big pain point in US, US healthcare <laughs> for startups is the sales cycle. Um, and um, I'm from originally a you know, work number of years at Microsoft. Um, I spoke to a few of my friends there focusing on a, a cloud sales to US healthcare. And what they're telling me that they're for Microsoft average sales cycle about two to three years. <laughs> two to three years for Microsoft to sell a product <laughs> uh, to like health system. Um, you know, you can imagine like in, in the consumer space, it's usually you know, a couple of minutes <laughs> versus yeah. two to three years in, in, in a corporate healthcare space. Um, so we are able to beat those numbers now, which is <laughs> <laughs> obviously great, otherwise we would survive. Um, but probably coming to coming back to your to your actual question, we engaged first couple of hospitals early on before we had the product. Mm-hmm. So um, and start conversation. So probably from time we started conversation to actually them using the product, it was over a year. Mm-hmm. Um, during that time, we actually built the MVP. So so so, so we knew uh, that that would take that long. So we engaged very early on. Um, we I think we even got a couple letters of intent uh, initially mm-hmm. uh, to help us with fundraising. Um, but we engaged very early on with expectation of very long sales cycle. So pretty much once product was ready, a few months after we were able to pilot with one hospital because we knew about this delay and proactively engaged a um, year ahead. No, that, that's, that's a very smart way to go about it, right? Understanding the sales cycle is going to be that low and, you, and actually using, your, using that to your advantage sounds like, right? Yeah, okay. we tried. We tried. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the strategy and the infrastructure. Right. So, um, what was when you were thinking about the team, 
right? So one thing you had mentioned, the dev team was, um, uh, you, you, you did it in Kia. Um, but then there's other different components to a business, right? There's the sales, there's the um, uh, uh, other functional departments, HR, legal, blah, blah, blah. As you were thinking about the team and as you're thinking of putting those foundational team blocks into place, what what was first? What was second? What was ancillary? What was in-house? What was outsourced? And how did you think about it in general? Mm-hmm. Yeah, as as a you know, small startup and being very frugal um, with our resources, we, we so that was kind of general strategy, you know, very small, very frugal. So um, and then focusing on you know MVP and minimal viable, you know, what do we need at the minimum to, to, to satisfy the customer expectations and, and to be able to get you know paid for our services? Mm-hmm. So our product specifically is two-sided marketplace. It's B2B. So on one side we have hospital, on the other side we has we have post-acute care providers, so small retirement facilities, small um, home health agencies, and you know, other facilities. And so hospitals pays us for the services, and those facilities get patients from the hospital uh, and we don't charge them right now um, also we're working on, on different um, uh, type of uh, service offering for them as well in the future um, so um, and in this situation it's kind of chicken and egg, chicken and egg situation we need a hospital to get the patient but we need the post-acute care facilities to push patients into so we need mm. hospital and the post-acute at the same time <laughs> <laughs> And you know, post acutes don't care about you unless you have hospital. Hospitals don't care about you unless you have post acutes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, so it's this chicken and egg situation. So, so we had to be creative there and kind of co market. So, so once we had a letter of intent and agreement from the hospital to pilot, we used kind of that agreement um, to market ourselves to post acutes as hospital is coming to our platform very soon. So, you guys go ahead and sign up for us. So, and basically, signing up those facilities became first kind of business function. Um, signing up, uh, onboarding, supporting uh, post-acute market is the big and important part of our business. And you know, mm-hmm. started early on and still continues and we have dedicated folks for working in that specific department. So uh, supporting uh, our secondary uh, post-acute customers. Mm-hmm. So that was the first and important part of, uh, of growing and creating separate uh, department. So did you decide to have um kind of build a subunit inside the business or the team that would do that acquisition um, after you've already built the um, the tech team or what was, or did you use some sort of like partnership agreements? How did you do that? Yeah, yeah. As you mentioned, so, so we said to, to build a so second second team uh, after the product was growing and, and we had the development team going forward with the core product. Um, we've built a second team. Um, yeah, initially, it was still very small. Initially, it was one person, one and a half person, mm-hmm. uh, focusing on a, a post-acute onboarding, a small facilities onboarding, supporting them, uh, marketing to them, maintaining community of post-acute facilities. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And when you think about the the cost centers and the profits and profit centers inside of you guys' business, how did you decide to structure them? Like, do you uh, do you look at departments as your cost centers, and then do the the different verticals that you guys tackle the market as, as profit centers or as a product or categories? How do you guys think about structuring those? Mm-hmm. Yeah, right now from, from the profit perspective, yeah, we're structuring different product offerings, uh, product offerings as the profit centers. Mm-hmm. Um, right now, um, kind of actively, we have two two kind of markets where we play in. Um, those will be our uh, profit centers. Uh, one, you know, major one being hospitals, and then we have um, second one, uh, smaller um, profit center. Right now, kind of you know, two product offerings, um, and we are actively working and have ideas on entering other similar uh, markets uh, close to our core uh, core market. Mm-hmm. Uh, in terms of the cost centers, it's basically, yeah, um, kind of core cost centers we have uh, right now, those supporting teams, supporting primary markets, supporting secondary markets, um, the product development team, um, and overall operations logistics teams. Mm-hmm. And um, so tell me a little bit about more about, one, your decision to to kind of go, go to Ukraine uh, for your tech team. And um, so one, why was that the case? Um, what were some of the challenges of having kind of your product and your investors and headquarters in the US? 
um, and then having the uh, the team that actually builds a product in Ukraine. Did you did you have language barriers? Did you have what were some of the some of the challenges that you had to overcome with that structure? Yeah, 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 yeah. Happy to share. Um, prior prior to the building this team, actually, I was working with a couple of consultants out of Ukraine, and uh, part of my work at Itira. Um, we are supporting uh, U.S. companies and developing them in healthcare uh, with technology, uh, technological products. Um, so I had a good relationship and understanding of the market. I uh, knew the kind of price point, cost points there, um, mm. and also had connections and contacts with the consultants working in the healthcare space specifically. Mm. Um, so that helped me a lot uh, diving diving early on. Um, then from kind of actual product creation perspective, also, um, I want to clarify uh, our product management team is here in Seattle, uh, in Seattle area. So uh, kind of envisioning specifications and uh, you know core aspects of the product uh, planning perspectives all happens here. Mm-hmm. Um, and the part of the team is actually the development team in, in Ukraine. So it's really collaboration and hybrid approach where we have part of the team here and there, and we work in tandem close together on making the product happen. Um, similarly, in operations perspective, uh, software operations perspective, we have uh, members of the team here in Seattle um, that are able to actually you know, practically deploy code to production, touch some production infrastructure, um, where offshore team not able to do it for compliance purposes and security purposes uh, as well. So, so, so practically speaking, it's a hybrid uh, onshore, offshore, you know, technically speaking. We have team members, security members here in Seattle, um, and then you know auxiliary, you know, a lot of horsepower uh, there in Kiev uh, to uh, augment and support what we do. Um, mm-hmm. Yep, yep. And as you can imagine, um, obviously the, the whole purpose of having a team in Ukraine is for cost optimization. Uh, obviously, the engineering resources and uh, offshore is uh, more affordable to you as a business. That's that's the primary driver for, for doing it. How do you manage the performance? Uh, in a team like that, where it's hybrid, where you've got people in the U- in, um, in Ukraine, people in the U.S., w- when you guys think in general about performance management in the organization, what does that mean uh, at Ada? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, you're touching on very sensitive <laughs> subjects. Obviously, um, you know, team, uh, team culture, performance, um, even basics of like responsiveness. Um, it's, it, it's hard. It's hard. There is, there is no simple answer. Um, but being small, being agile, um, I, I usually travel to Ukraine at least once a year, usually a couple of times a year. Um, we have other team members traveling once in a while, uh, back and forth. Um, what I think what I'm proud of saying that, um, longevity, longevity of employment is, is with us very high. So our okay, number of core developers are with the product. Uh, for the full duration of, of this time. So uh, we have a enge- couple of engineers, one engineer working for four years on our product, second working for three years. Um, so having, you know, great stable team, committed people um, would help us significantly. So so you know, having this culture um, kind of helps and, and, and fostering innovation and fostering people's talent um, clearly helped us to avoid uh, churn, you know, people's churn. Um, mm-hmm. And you know, in the long run, really significantly helped us uh, to eliminate some of the common pitfalls um, of offshore development. Yeah. And so back to the product and um, your engagement with uh, with uh, with customers, or at least those who are in the pilot. How do you tackle? Uh, in a new in a new product, how do you tackle the pricing structure, and what were some of the pieces that you were cons- that you were putting into consideration as you were saying, "Hey, customer, it's going to cost you X." Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, that's the, you know the, the whole pricing strategy and, and and pricing evolution. I would say it's it's, it's very fascinating subject and happy to share you know, concepts of it. Um, so, so when we started, with, we, we talked to a um, number of local hospitals that I mentioned, a number of hospitals never used product like us. And, and uh, we still, as we as we still selling products, many of hospitals have never used products. So we are new, new to them. Mm-hmm. As we are a brand new product to them and they're not aware of competition, um, they don't have any comparative points, you know, how much it's supposed to cost. 
what the competition charge is. There's no competition uh, in some markets, so, so there is no nothing to compare to. So this is how we started. When we started, we didn't know about any specific you know, head head competitors, so um, there is nothing to compare to. Um, then you know. Then next question we ask is, you know, what value are we bringing to the customer? Let's try to calculate value that we bring to the customer, mm -hmm. uh, and then maybe let's charge, you know, 10, 20, 30 percent of that value that we bring <laughs> to the customer. <laughs> so the specific pain point that we are solving for the hospitals is a patient overstay. So um, well, one of the pain points we are solving, but that's relatively simple to calculate. So we have a patient in the hospital. Um, average U.S. hospital uh, usually charges um, insurance, your insurance, about five thousand dollars per day for your stay. Mm -hmm. um, when you've been discharged from the hospital medically, you can you can go home. If you cannot go home, you are staying, still staying in the hospital and occupying the hospital bed. But during this time, insurance will not reimburse the full cost of the bed because technically you're discharged. Mm -hmm. um, so um, by us finding placement for the patient sooner, we gonna kind of give the, those money back to the hospital because they will be able to discharge patients sooner. Mm -hmm. so the opportunity cost is about five thousand dollars of savings and opportunity per day. Per day, yes, mm -hmm. per day per patient. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, and kind of talking about examples, for example, um, there was a famous case it was in the news in Seattle area where a patient overstayed at the local um, hospital for three years. So three <laughs> years, five thousand dollars a day. Um, you can calculate how much you know, overstay uh, hospital had to um, basically eat on, mm -hmm. on that specific patient. Um, so, so our value propositions: we are saving hospital, you know, those those opportunity costs by finding right placement for the right patient at the right time. Mm -hmm. So when we initially calculated, uh, kind of did rough calculation of how much we are saving uh, per patient, then we looked at the population of the patients in the hospital. It's a publicly available uh, data out of CMS. Um, uh, we calculated our cost should be somewhere in the ballpark of $150 uh, per bed per hospital, roughly speaking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was good, good, kind of, you know, high level equations and and we try to go with it <laughs> and no one liked it <laughs> <laughs> not even close um so so you know can, that was three years ago so can coming back now our actual costs are um probably our actual prices are probably five times less <laughs> than uh -huh. the number <laughs> approximately um but this is how we started so so basically since you know, coming back to your question you know what was the price uh, because there is no competition, you direct one-to-one -one competition in a specific market, we had mm -hmm. to look at the value we are bringing to the customer, we had to monetize that value and uh, charge 20% from that value. That was our initial first attempt at, uh, at price. <laughs> and then evolving from, from that. <laughs> I, I can only imagine the conversation at first of, of okay, here, here's the price. <laughs> Thicker shock. Nope, no thank you. <laughs> Doors right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. So let's talk a little bit about the future, right? So as you're looking at um, uh, at the company, what are how do you view the business evolving over time? What do you what do you guys see the vision of the organization to be, and and what position is uh, do you guys intend to take in the marketplace? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a great question. And really, we created aid with the idea of helping U.S. healthcare um, and aid, you know, support and help um, core value that we are bringing to our customers. And um, you know, being in healthcare for for a number of years now, close to five years, and really seeing, you know, that the current state is uh, technologically wise is, is really not there. Um, we are seeing you know, significant cost overruns across all um, segments of the market uh, and, and the system in general. So our goal is to bring modern thinking, new technology into the healthcare um, and save costs um, mm -hmm. by providing good quality care for the patients. We are starting this very specific uh, problem of patient overstay uh, right now. Um, however, we are definitely seeing different problems in the same area, uh, in the same space of healthcare, focusing on the geriatric elderly patients. Um, with uh, baby boomers, you know, um, getting to the age of retirement uh, or retiring now uh, and entering the whole healthcare sphere more and more right now, um, we are 
kind of foreseeing um, that swell of healthcare services from from those new uh, new customers coming to healthcare um, coming in, and we would like to help the system to uh, modernize it to save mm-hmm. costs and to improve care for those baby boomers. Um, as I mentioned, starting from just transition of care, looking into now transportation, looking into um, durable medical equipment uh, markets. Um, so supporting uh, retirees as they enter healthcare system and transition to different phases of healthcare system. Mm-hmm. That's our vision strategy. So how do you t- how do you intend to like who's your, who's your primary point of contact, right in the in the market in general? Obviously, on a day to day basis, it's uh, it's the uh, your customer is is the um, uh, is the hospital, but as you foresee ADA developing and becoming a, uh, a larger larger player in the marketplace, do you foresee yourself going after the consumer, right, the retiree, and saying, "Hey, you want to make sure that that you know who we are because we are responsible for making for uh, f- for making sure that you're comfortable in the place that you're at." Or do you intend to be a purely B two B platform that only engages with uh, with uh, with the people who are uh, with hospitals? Yeah, yeah, we do. We do foresee us getting into um, consumer market. Um, we kind of right now thinking about creating a specific actively pursuing customer facing uh, consumer facing application. Um, we haven't released it yet. Um, uh, but there are specific use cases of even our current uh, care transition uh, product that would benefit from um, patient engagement uh, mm-hmm. specifically. So there is specific uh, cases there even now. Uh, but as we grow further and, and, and get into auxiliary uh, markets uh, around just pure transition and you know, more general retirement and retirement health care, um, we definitely foresee entering and, and playing a role in the consumer part of the market. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but also kind of you know looking at from a financial business perspective and understanding how current healthcare system works, the actual financial markets, you know, financial part of the market is purely B2B in the healthcare. Um, how funds transfer and move uh, from entities from you know from medicated care to specific health insurance to potentially accountable care organizations, the uh, ACOs, to hospitals, to retirement facilities. It's all back-end way to be transactions. So if we would like to prosper and have you know, financial, financially um, safe future, we have to have a strong presence in the B2B side mm-hmm. to be able to tap into those um, uh, business cycles. So how do you not get confused, right? Because so uh, I've faced this with some of the clients that, I, that I've been working at and defining the customer oftentimes is very difficult especially when you're on both sides of the transaction because the consumer is the influencer. They influence the, the perception, they influence the experience, the, 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 and they feed that information back to the underlying customer. The customer then is the person who is paying your bill, who is paying your, your invoices, but um, they are, uh, you know, the, the, they're highly transactional. So, identifying and trying to understand who's who, right? And what and what type of communication you're sending one versus another and being very clear with the team internally of what the messaging are is, is very difficult. How do you foresee sifting between the two? Do you foresee that, hey, we're going to eventually begin communicating with the, under, the underlying consumer, but we're primarily focused with the, with the customer? Or is it that, we're, we're so concerned with the, inf- the influence that the consumer has, the majority of our communication is going to go there. How do you foresee kind of the mix in communication between the two? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a tough, tough conversation in healthcare um, and um, in US, U.S. healthcare specifically because of how, how different it is from a business perspective, um, how different it is from any other industries and businesses, uh, I would like to say. Um, and that's first statement. Second thing is, um, practically speaking, for us, even now, without having consumer as the persona, we already have three, four, five personas in the system as it is right now. Mm-hmm. So, for example, currently, currently, um, we have the hospital and hospital discharge teams who would 
primary user product and pay for our product. Then we have those post-acute facilities who would take the patient. So, uh, so our core current uh, users right now, those two very different segments uh, of population. So um, then uh, during this transition, also very often um, nurse assessment, which is a kind of mandated third step sometimes is needed in the middle. So the, the third population of users is the uh, independent uh, nurses who have to come and assess the state of the patient. So now we have three three people you know, in, this, in this equation. Then we have a payer. Payer is an insurance company who would pay for the services of hospital and social work, uh, hospital and post acute care facility. Then we have the fourth person. So, so right now we're dealing with four uh, very different uh, people uh, whose incentive and financial competition is very different uh, from each other. Uh, so consumer will be a fifth of six in, in our equation. Yeah. Uh -huh. yep, yep, yep. So that, that's our reality. So our reality is operating between six, seven, eight different um, stakeholders uh, for one transaction uh, in, in our current system. So, uh, but kind of answering your question, also our transaction is hyper-local. So, because you have a patient, an elderly patient in Seattle, who who is currently in a specific hospital, let's say it's Harborview in, in Seattle, then he he would like to go to post-acute care facility in let's say in um, uh, downtown Seattle area, uh, and there's only four or five or maybe three care facilities in that specific area. And if you're in Seattle, you're lucky you'll have some options. But if you are in the middle in in the middle of Washington State, somewhere in the rural area, you probably gonna have one or two at, at best. Mm -hmm. So also kind of you know being hyper local um, changes your perspective on marketing and communication um, because you know hyper local markets they don't need as much of marketing and, and messaging versus you know global national markets. Mm -hmm. It also kind of shifts um, how we do that as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think I didn't answer your question. I provided more uh, complexity to our situation, you know, having six, seven, eight personas and being hyper local. But that situation dramatically changes the perspective from, you know, from traditional, you know, yep. B2B global national online uh, SaaS mm -hmm. platform. Right. Yeah, not uh, that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Michael. So I uh, we're near towards the end here, and the last question that I always lo love to ask is: um, when you look towards the future, for me, there are certain things that excite me, and there are certain things that scare me. What are those things for you? Yeah, yeah. The thing that scares me is, um, is is the system and and how U.S. health has been changing over the past you know, ten years. Uh, starting with Obamacare, then the you know, next administration comes to initiative changing it slightly. Now we'll see what's going to happen with this administration. So all those changes in, in U.S. healthcare, how they affect us. Um, so that, that's that scary part, uh, scary mm -hmm. part, and, and not knowing you know what direction healthcare is going to go from um, from you know from overall perspective um, in general. But what, but kind of what is simpler and understood is the reality of it. You know, we, we have all the population, it's only growing. Um, we have our systems that is overloaded, um, that is urging for innovation, that needs our help, um, help of startup companies of um, basically investing technology, innovating and helping our doctors and nurses to, to be able to survive this uh, oncoming, unslave of the retirees. Mm -hmm. And then what excites you? Um, this brings innovation, brings innovation, making everyone's life easier, you know, making uh, life easier for those social workers that we work with every day, with nurses who have to care for those patients, um, for those patients who are at the right facility are much better off from all perspectives, mental, physical, outcome perspective. So um, I think in general, kind of caring and support and, um, Caring, support, innovation has been my um, thread throughout my career, and I'm happy to continue it in the healthcare space. Great. Well, uh, Michael, I really appreciate your time. Uh, thank you for for a very interesting conversation and a lot of insights there. Um, wish you the best of luck with uh, you personally and with Ada, and I really hope that we'll uh, revisit this conversation in a couple of years and see what see where the progress has been. So appreciate it, and wish you best of luck. Absolutely. Looking forward to it. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you.